in a moment you listen to uh, the lecture by Professor Debbie Robertson, um, who whose contribution to this conference will be a little bit different than than the rest, if I can say so, um, because it's not exactly in the topic of cooperation and culture in shaping the future of Europe, but rather belongs to general theoretical issues in cross-cultural psychology. And it was my intention that, well, there is a general topic of the conference, general theme, but still it should not be related just to, it would be too Eurocentric to talk only about uh, our problems. So this uh, contribution, this lecture that you will listen to in a moment uh, deals with basic theoretical problems in culture and psychology. Uh, Professor Debbie Robertson received her PhD at University of London uh, in 1999 and uh, since the beginning of this century uh, was a professor at uh, Essex, University of Essex, now retired. Uh, well, during the 15 years of her academic career, uh, she had uh, this number of publications which I could find in uh, bibliometric uh, indices. There may be more. Uh, it covers the time of 15, 16 years. And um, the impact points, as you can see, of these publications are very high. The citation number as well. It's here you have by uh, well, f 15 years, the number of citations per year and uh, the papers which received most citations, uh, well, they are earlier, that's not normal. They usually uh, cover the domain of color perception or categorical perception um, in, well, uh, far away cultures, uh, as you will listen in a moment, and also uh, facial expressions. So she is in the line of con continuing the line of um, uh, Friesen and Ekman from the late 60s, and also uh, Heider Roche, who worked in, uh, well, the classical works in color perception and emotional expression. So this is the uh, state of the art research in our days. Uh, not to spend more time, uh, uh, welcome Debbie, please uh, give us your contribution. So um, what I'm gonna be talking about today, given that, uh, as Pavel said, this is a, a fairly ancient line of research, um, is, is really, you know, is there, is there any point in continuing it? Is there anything we can still learn, that, anything left to find out about uh, perceptual categories that we don't already know? So, uh, first of all, I should say, uh, Pavel's right in saying that my research is not done in Europe. Do some sound in that in a minute. This is our interpreter who uh, joined in enthusiastically in any uh, singing and dancing and morning greetings. But uh, these, are, these are the Himba. They live in uh, northern Namibia um, in small family groups uh, in the, the Kaukavelt, which is a uh, fairly sort of desert-like uh, area of, of northern Namibia on the west coast of Africa. Uh, and quite a lot of my research has been done with them. Um, so, uh, bring this right up to date, there's a very recent article in Behavior and Brain Sciences, which um, 
interrogates the accumulated evidence that our visual percepts, and they do concentrate specifically on, on visual categorization, visual experience rather than uh, auditory experience, but our visual experience can be inter influenced by our world knowledge, this idea that perception is con cognitively penetrable. Um, they, uh, much of their discussion, uh, although they don't go back in terms of their summary of the literature quite as far as that, but much of their research discussion concerns this issue of whether classifications of color and emotion come pre-programmed in humans. That's the idea that, that the, the nature view, that they either come as a product of our biology, of the setup of our visual systems, or they come as a product of given from the world. So that, that there are a limited uh, range of uh, things that are visible in the world. So, but in either way, it would be constrained by nature rather than learned through nurture. The alternative view is that uh, the, these categories are learned and culturally determined, and therefore it follows that they would be free to vary. So after the uh, very elegant uh, progression of uh, social science paradigms following the changes in the paradigmatic shifts in uh, physical sciences that uh, Milton laid out yesterday. I thought I'd try and do the same for uh, the disciplines that I've worked in, for color and for facial expression categorization. And uh, I have to say, it was chaos. So if you look at what goes on in terms of color category research, you get in the 1950s, uh, the first sort of uh, discovered by Brown and Lenneberg, this idea of, hey, language influences perception because colors that are easier to name are easy to remember and easier to pick out of a display. Uh, swiftly followed in the 1960s, the work of Berlin and Kay and Roche who said, but no, it doesn't. We, there is only one set of, of unique color categories, and by sheer chance, they just happen to be the ones that are named in English. Um, so, and, and everybody in the world has these categories, whether they name them or not. Uh, then in the 1970s, they became a bit defensive. They said, okay, so we have discovered that there are some uh, people who don't name these categories and show some apparent effects. Um, uh, that are some apparent differences from English speakers. But these are trivial and needn't concern us because underneath these trivial superficial differences, uh, they still have the same categories uh, in mind that, that we have. Um, fast forward a bit to the 1990s and you get the sort of minimization position. The okay, by now we have discovered that there are quite a lot of languages that do things differently. Um, and there seem to be some apparent effects of these uh, linguistic differences uh, on our memory and uh, perception. But these arise only because these particular languages that we've looked at, that have been looked at are on an evolutionary trajectory. And they have, so they will eventually develop the uh, optimal 11 basic categories that are named in English. They just haven't got there yet. Um, so that was kind of about the point that I came into the discussion. Um, so we had some publications, the late 90s, around about 2000, um, where we suggested that actually these differences in, in the way that color categories and facial expression categories were named were non-trivial and did have some fairly profound effects on perception and, and memory. Um, so then Kay and Regier in 2003 re-examined their data and uh, analyzed my, some of my data alongside it. Uh, and they said, well, yes, you're right. There are some quite apparently fundamental differences there. Um, but on the other hand, the differences don't matter as much as the similarities. It's the similarities between these languages that we really want to count on. And those are, those are, the similarities are bigger than the, uh, than the differences.
Uh, and then uh, in 2007, Winner et al. did a, a little neat little experiment with uh, Russian speakers, and they said, oh no, hang on a minute, um, these differences are quite pervasive. Uh, they exist not just for languages that have fewer color categories than we have, but also for languages that have more color categories than we have. So Russian and indeed most of the languages uh, around the Mediterranean uh, in the blue region have more color terms, more basic color terms than we have. So Russian has two terms, Sini and Goloboy, uh, which represent dark blue and light blue, which are, for a Russian speaker, considered to be completely basic in Berlin and K's terms. That is not subsumed in, within each other. So uh, to give you an example of that, uh, English has sort of subcategories of uh, something like blue, so we could say that things are royal blue or light blue or sky blue, or, but we would all consider all of those to be subcategories of blue. The difference for Russian speakers is that Sini is not a subcategory of Goloboy, and Goloboy is not a subcategory of Sini. They are uh, considered to be uh, separate, in completely separate in their own right. So. The argument that the, the differences that you find between languages in the number of color categories that their language expresses are trivial because they're on an evolutionary trajectory towards the optimum set falls apart there, I think, because immediately here you have examples of, and there are quite a few of them now, so there are examples from Greek, Italian, Farsi, uh, as well as from Russian, um, of languages that have more color categories than 11, more basic categories than 11, and still show those same uh, differences. Then you get even, even closer to the ideal, the sort of adaptation, the idea that we can accept the fact that uh, different languages and different cultures process things in different visual experience in different ways. Um, so this is the sort of com completion of the relativistic, the shift from universalism to relativism. Um, so Mitra et al. did an experiment where they compared German and Dutch um, measure, uh, classifications of the colors yellow and orange. So what they did was they gave, yellow, uh, they gave um, Dutch speakers and German speakers uh, a a range of colors that range from yellow to orange. And they asked them to match the appropriate colors to the colors on um, some images. And the images were either of a sock, an orange, a banana, or the middle of three traffic lights. Uh, the reason that this was of interest to them is that the middle of three traffic lights is termed yellow in German but orange in Dutch. Um, now, it's a European standard light, so there shouldn't be any differences, in, in fact, between German traffic lights and, uh, and Dutch traffic lights. But the Germans reliably matched it to a yellower color and called it yellow more often than Dutch speakers. Dutch speakers more often called it orange and matched it to a, a more orange shade even though the two groups showed no differences in the way that they matched the color of socks or bananas or oranges. Um, so far, so good, except that in 2016, uh, there's a paper by Brogard and Gatzia that says, oh, no, it's not. If, cognition, if it's cognitively penetrable and it's affected by language, it's not perception. It's something else. It's some higher level processing that, that in the brain that we don't count. If, if, in other words, if cognition affects it, whatever it is, it's not perception. So um, not, as, not as clear a progression as you would like. Um, and uh, to put it another way, the sort of argument has followed, the, the argument in, in Facial expression research has followed very similar sort of lines. So sort of perceptual categories are relative and then perceptual categories are, no, they're universal. 
Um, well, they're universally relative. No, they're relatively universal. Um, uh, if categories are relative, then they aren't perceptual. Oh, yes, they are. Oh, no, they're not. And, and, and it kind of goes on like that. So um, I wish that we had a, a, the, this wonderful, coherent uh, progression that the social sciences have, but we ain't got there yet. So just to sort of go back to the beginning and fill you in a bit on the original sort of arguments, that the, the nature argument, the argument that things like uh, color categories uh, and facial expression categories of emotion are determined in some way either by the properties of our visual systems or by the properties that are given in the world. For color categories, the... the Proponents were Berlin, first proponents were Berlin and Kay, and they proposed a universal set of 11 basic color categories in 1969. Um, Ekman and Friesman, Friesen uh, proposed a universal set of six basic categories of facial expression of emotion um, in 1971. And both of these were based on comparisons of Western undergraduates, I guess we call them the weirdos, um, those are the people from Western, industrialized, educated, rich, democratic societies, uh, and, and a comparison with pre-literate cultures, um, so traditional cultures like the Himba. Um, both of them proposed that there were sets of named categories that can, are considered basic in the English language that happened to be the optimal set and were universally recognized and implicitly used by members of cultures that do not name them. That's quite a major claim because what it implies is that an infant born in the UK or the US is a really fortunate infant because they come with built-in sets of categories that they will use for the rest of their lives. So they will be able to recognize happy from sad, from angry, from disgusted, um, from afraid, they will be able to recognize pink, purple, orange, and brown, as well as red, blue, green, and yellow. But think then what happens to the unfortunate infants born in the Himba culture or in cultures in Papua New Guinea who have only three or four of those categories in, that, that are used and expressed by adults and, and ha have words that exist for them in their language those infants will grow up and at some point will have to learn that the, the, the set of categories that they have in mind, the ones that come hardwired into the system, are the wrong ones for their culture. And they have to learn to override those with a different set of categories. So you could imagine that the task for those infants would be much more difficult um, than in terms of processing perceptual categories than it is for uh, the lucky ones like us who uh, are born with the right set in the first place. Um, there's a, a, a nice sort of uh, little, one of those phrases that uh, get stuck on desks and things like that, that says, of course I don't look busy. I did it right the first time. And you kind of think that's just what Berlin and Kay and Ekman, Paul Ekman had in mind. So uh, the hypothesis for color was based on Rosh Haider's work with famous work with the uh, Dugam Dani in Papua New Guinea. And uh, for facial expressions, it was based on uh, work done also in Papua New Guinea by Ekman and Friesen. In both cases, the available choice of stimuli that they used were somewhat ethnocentric. Um, they were restricted and best, based on the best examples of English language categories. So this is the set of, of colors that were used to elicit color names and to investigate color memory. They vary in hue in this direction and in lightness in this direction. And, uh, well, as you can see, these facial expressions would be recognized by anybody anywhere in the world. 
Um, they are somewhat dated now, and I have to say it's a long time since I, I, I stopped using these with small children because they find them absolutely terrifying. <laughs> so what's wrong with these sets of stimuli? Well, both sets were highly familiar to Western cultures, um, but novel to members of remote traditional cultures. Uh, the colors were at maximum saturation. Now, these are sort of pictures that I, I took uh, in Namibia a couple of years back and as you can see there isn't in the natural environment that they live in there aren't many examples of highly saturated reds, blues, greens or yellows not to mention pink, purple, orange and brown. Um, all the faces of course were white. Um, and these guys, particularly the little ones um, how, w for for the, the under fours, we were the first white people that they'd seen. So in both cases, the argument was that matching, uh, perceptual matching uh, and memory similarities between the participants uh, from the Western cultures and the traditional cultures, that there were enough similarities between their performance to provide strong evidence that these universal categories were there implicitly in mind, even if they weren't expressed in language and culture. And in both cases, the proposed set of universal categories are those that are named in English. And, but interestingly, these two lines of research have for a long time proceeded in parallel, but each of them has been proposed to be a unique case. So even though at, back at the beginning of this research, uh, someone like Eleanor Roche was looking for uh, an, an answer to how we categorize in general rather than how we categorize perceptual categories in particular. It's just that it was impossible to test whether if your language doesn't have words for truth, justice, or the rights of man, can you still think about them? Well, nobody could formulate an experiment that would test that proposal. But to test the proposal that if your language doesn't have words for red, green, and yellow, can you still uh, pick them out of an array, was an easier task. So the, the color research was originally uh, devised as a test of a more general proposition about categorization. Um, but over, the, over time, researchers came to regard this as a, as a sort of unique case um, that was special in the sense that, that colors um, are more fundamental to our perception of the world than, than other more abstract categories. And the same thing was proposed for categories of emotion. So in each of these fields, the research has proceeded in parallel, but until really the beginning of this century, nobody tied the two together and said, look at the parallels between these two fields of research. So that's something that's only happened quite recently. And in 1995, when I started my PhD, uh, the universalist views for both um, colors and, and emotions were unquestioned and as, as fact in most uh, undergraduate textbooks. Um, and my PhD were, was done in uh, Papua New Guinea and um, around about the time I'd finished it, I became aware of the alternative relativistic point of view. This is the uh, idea that the experience of participating in different social practices can lead to temporary and long-term culture-specific perceptual tuning so that individuals in different societies come to perceive the world in fundamentally different ways. Um, an example of this that's outside of the sort of perceptual categorization area would be um, a, an Amazonian language that has uh, more words for caterpillars and grubs and things than we have in, in zoological classifications in the West, uh, but they have only one word for all moths and butterflies. Um, generally speaking, the, the anthropological view is, well, they eat the grubs and the caterpillars, they don't eat the butterflies. <laughs> 
Um, so the idea is that you develop a rich vocabulary for the things that are salient in your environment because those are the ones that you need to communicate about. So th this issue, I think, remains a question about whether um, individuals who have fundamentally different ways of classifying uh, perceptual categories in their language, whether they really see the world differently, whether this provides a different, a different perspective on the world, or whether it merely reflects um, the cognitive development that permits and constrains its acquisition. So somebody like Melissa Bauman, sadly no longer with us, suggested that language is potentially catalytic and transformative of cognition. And that's still a highly controversial idea. So even though there have been a number of recent suggestions of ways in which uh, cognition might influence perfection, perception, and these include language and culture, but are not restricted to that. So expertise, conceptual knowledge, expectations, attention, action, emotion in terms of our mood, um, individual differences, uh, memory and things like that have all been proposed to be able to af make, uh, to affect our perceptual uh, experiences. The recent rebuttals of that have suggested that if cognitive factors affected it's not perception, that cognition only affects perception in the very trivial sense that, for instance, if we turn out the light, or choose to close our eyes, then what we see is, is restricted, goes, is, is different. Um, and they've suggested that all the empirical findings that show an effect of cognition on, on perceptual categorization result from some flaws in the methodology. If we find these effects, it's because we're doing it wrong. Um, so, uh, they have conceded that if it turns out that our color experiences are indeed affected by color-related belief, knowledge or memory acquired after the maturity of our sensory systems, then it follows that color experience is cognitively pen penetrable. They just don't accept that the first part of that uh, sentence has happened yet. But it would follow if it was the case that color experiences are affected by beliefs, knowledge, or memory, or language, that at the very least, visual perceptual experiences are free to vary in some way uh, in different cultures and with individual differences within a culture. Firestone and Skoll this year described this as the provocative claim that our beliefs, desires, and emotions and actions, and even the languages we speak, can directly influence what we see. So as far as they're concerned, this is still just not on the cards. So they describe six major flaws that um, we have engaged in a confirmatory research strategy. And I should point out that although they are criticizing um, specifically research that has shown cognitive effects, on per perception for these things. These things apply equally well to the researchers who have uh, used the data to promote a universalist point of view. So uh, I think that both sides of the argument need to be able to provide a robust defense uh, against these accusations. So one, the first one is that we've all indulged in a confirmatory research strategy. We set out to design experiments only that will prove us right. We don't set out to uh, design an experiment that would potentially falsify our hypotheses. That we confuse perception with judgment. We're asking people to make an, a, a subjective judgment about uh, some perceptual stimuli, uh, and we confuse that, that, that it, act of judging, making a judgment about things with perception. That there are demand characteristics and response biases that um, our participants are compliant individuals who will um, tell us what we want to hear. 
that there are some low-level differences in the stimuli that we're using that create these differences. So when we're devising some, uh, for instance, asking people to uh, say whether two, stimuli, two colors are the same or different, that in some way we, we build into the experiment some low-level difference between the stimuli that we're using that drives the result that we find. That there are some peripheral attentional effects um, that we're encouraging participants to attend to one aspect of the stimuli uh, more than others and that this drives the result that we're finding. And finally, that what we are in fact uh, collecting data on is, is memory and recognition uh, rather than perception. Now, at this point, you'll be thinking, um, well, if I'm going to uh, look at these flaws in detail, it must be because I'm convinced that my research can stand up to all these accusations. And you're right. So, since they, since they view these potential pitfalls as a limited and comprehensive set, so they've suggested that all research that shows effects of cognition on perception is uh, subject to one of these uh, potential flaws. Um, and they said, and that, that's it, that's all the sort of things that could be wrong with it. So, in that case, I'm on a winner here because if I can prove that my research is not subject to all those six flaws, then they would have to accept at least the possibility of a relativistic world. So, together with a number of collaborators, uh, over the last uh, 15 or so years, we've investigated uh, um, perceptual categorization in adults and children from a variety of different cultures, the Burinmo in Papua New Guinea, the Himba in uh, northern Namibia, Korean, Japanese, Chinese, Italian, Greek, and English. We haven't yet managed the Welsh, um, but it's an interesting case because the Welsh language does not have separate terms for green and blue. Like many other languages in the world, it has a GRU term, a, a, a single uh, category for, for both green and blue. And it was the case 20 years ago that you could not find a Welsh speaker who had never spoken English because English was mandatory in Welsh schools and indeed Welsh children were punished for speaking their own language in school. But over the last 20 years, uh, the Welsh government, the Welsh parliament has uh, rescinded a lot of those uh, sort of prescriptions. And it's now the case that you can find children who have grown up entirely speaking Welsh. Of course, you can't guarantee that they haven't watched uh, children's television <laughs> in English or uh, been exposed to other um, influences, but uh, at some point in the future it might be possible to test a group of, of Welsh-speaking individuals who've actually never come across the, the two separate terms for green and blue. I don't think it is at the moment, but it's a nice thought that it might be. So, Alongside testing um, uh, different populations, we've also tested some non-typical populations within uh, the English-speaking population. So we've looked at what happens to individuals with uh, aphasia resulting from brain damage, um, or those who are uh, low functioning on the autistic spectrum. Um, and in both ca those cases, we were interested because they were not using language. And the main focus of our research has been categorical perception. Um, so just before I, in, I can go into how our research stands up to these accusations um, of fatal flaws, 
Just to give you a, a, a brief rundown, and I don't want to go into too much detail about the, the methodology, because um, apart from anything else, you'll all go to sleep. Um, but this is the idea that some items that come from different categories are discriminated faster and more accurately than items that come from the same category. So this never works really well because um, the properties of overhead projectors vary so much between one auditorium and another that you can never get these quite right. But suspend disbelief with me for a minute and accept that when we run these experiments in a lab with a properly calibrated monitor, the physical separation between this screen stimulus and this screen stimulus is the same as the physical separation between this stimulus and this stimulus is the same as the one between this one and this one. So the physical separation of these colors in terms of the number of just noticeable differences that they are apart is identical. I hope you, most of you will agree with me that these two would be called green. This one would be called green and this one would be called blue and these two would be called blue. Anyone disagree with that? What do you think? Colorblind. Okay. <laughs> so okay, fair enough. Okay. Well, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what we find in general is, uh, and the way that these, the easiest way to uh, set up these type of experiments is that you show people a single co color patch, a single stimulus, or a single uh, image of a facial expression. Uh, with a, you can do the same thing with morphing to morph from one facial expression to another. Uh, you show them one stimulus, and then in, after a short interval, you show them a pair of stimuli, and you say, which one of these two did I show you before? And people are faster and more accurate to select the correct uh, member of the pair if they come from two different categories than if they come from the same category. This is a very robust finding. It's been found for colors, for facial expressions, and for other sets of stimuli as well. It's been found across a large number of different paradigms. Um, and. Uh, Interestingly, too, it only occurs, you only find these effects it, where a category boundary is marked in the culture and language of the individual. So English speakers show this effect that the cross-category items are easier to uh, discriminate and remember than the within-category items at the bound, and boundary between green and blue. So if you take one from this side and one from this side, you'd find better discrimination than in the center here. But for speakers of other languages, they show this effect in different places along the same continuum. So using the same set of stimuli, where you find a, a, an advantage for these two, for English speakers, you find an advantage for Barinmo speakers between their category war and null, which is boundary falls about here. You find it for Himba speakers here in the, between these two sets. And you find it for Russian speakers and for Greek speakers around about here in the middle of, in between light blue and dark blue. So the idea here is that categorical perception, this idea that assigning things to different categories in some house it speeds and, and improves the, the rate at which we can discriminate them. So it adds something to the, the perceptual discriminability of, of these uh, stimuli. Um, is quite widespread across different cultures. And it's the case that any explanation that we can put forward for categorical perception needs to be of a general nature because we find it for colors and we find it for facial expressions of emotion. Now, both colors and emotions have been proposed to be innate 
sort of universal categories in some way. But we also find this effect for uh, another set of stimuli that could not possibly be inbuilt uh, or a property of our visual systems, and that's for facial identity. So if you morph between two faces, uh, in this case Tom Cruise and Jim Carrey, um, you find this categorical perception effect, the better discrimination, faster discrimination of the cross-category than the within-category items. But obviously these have to be learned because it's not difficult to find people who've never seen these individuals. And if they've never seen them before, they don't show this effect. We know that this uh, effect doesn't result from some permanent tuning of perceptual systems. So it's, it's not the case that, um, that, this, that, that our perceptual system is, is permanently warped by learning perceptual categories. Um, because discrimination sensitivity is not greater at the boundaries uh, in threshold tasks. So a threshold task is when uh, I would show you one uh, stimulus and then show you a second stimulus and ask you, is it the same or different from the first one? And the difference, bet I can reduce the difference between the two colors or two facial expressions, two whatever, down to a point where you are only reliably saying, yes, it's different 50% of the time. So when you're right 50% of the time and wrong 50% of the time, you can't differentiate those two items. So a just noticeable difference is that difference that you can reliably discriminate 75% of the time. Um, and that difference stays the same across the whole range of stimuli. It's only above threshold differences that are affected by uh, categorical perception. So it's not some permanent tuning that makes these, uh, the boundaries uh, more distinct than the, the within category items. It's also quite easy to get rid of categorical perception, to eliminate this effect. All you have to do is to get your participants to sit down and do the whole experiment going and, 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 and. So you occupy their linguistic system. Participants hate doing that. They're very bad at it and they hate doing it. So it's eliminated with a secondary verbal task but not a visual one. So it clearly is some kind of a language effect. But what happens when you use verbal interference, when you occupy the, the, the verbal system, is somewhat surprising because it's not that those, the, the, the good discrimination of the two items from different categories gets worse. The categorical perception goes away because the within category discriminations get better. So when you're, com when you're comparing two blues and saying which of these two stimuli did you see before, those discriminations get better. Uh, visual tasks, search tasks often show laterality effects. This is differences between processing in the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. Um, again, this is believed to be linked to language because language processing happens for, for most of us in the left hemisphere. Um, and it occurs for types of stimuli like familiar faces. And uh, here are some faces that might look vaguely but not quite familiar. Um, these are, and the, the, the idea with these is that although they are in fact 50-50 blends, of uh, famous individuals. Generally speaking, you look at them and one or other face appears to, to dominate. So that one, I think, is Brangelina. Um, that's Michael Jackson with somebody else. Um, Jennifer Lopez, possibly? Oh, no, that's Jennifer Lopez and George Bush. Um, <laughs> And that's Mel Gibson and, I uh, can't remember. So in terms of the research into categorical perception, 
um, and, and the, these criticisms that have been put forward. Um, the, the, the first one, the confirmatory bias, the, the idea that we're only testing um, the, 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 the the, to find the effects that we expect to find. We're not testing to disconfirm our hypotheses. They argue that experiments that show effective linguistic categorization on perceptual similarity use a color space that's specifically constructed to be perceptually uniform, so that each step represents the same perceptual difference. So their argument here is the architecture of the color space that you're using to test should already account for perceptual clustering effects caused by labeling. So, and at first glance, they might have a point because the way that the, these uh, steps across a perceptual space are established in the first place as being equal steps is that each pair of these stimuli is compared by a panel of experts to two reference greys. So you take two shades of grey and you take uh, each of these pairs of stimuli and you say, is the difference in hue between this pair of stimuli greater or smaller than the difference between, in, between this pair of greys? And it's done by a panel of experts, and it might surprise you to learn that the panel of experts uh, were in Rochester uh, in the States, and they were all male, and they were all white. Um, so it might have been the case that uh, they somehow were biased by their own categories, and that they set up this color space in a, in a biased way so that it was bound to, to bring out, any experiment that used this was, was bound to bring out these effects. Um, and it could have, if, it, if you only found these effects for the boundary between green and blue, but hang on a minute, we find the same effects for the boundary between the uh, Barinmo categories, Wall and Nor and Wall, uh, and then we find it again for the Himba categories, Ndumbu and Burau, uh, and we find it in different places, but not at all between these stimuli for Chinese. And they couldn't possibly have programmed all of those boundaries into uh, the, the set of stimuli that we used in the first place because they didn't know they were there. So I think that gets us around the confirmatory bias uh, flaw. I don't think we need to, I think we can consign that one to the dustbin. Are we confusing perception with judgment? So uh, judgments like estimating the relative ripeness or redness of fruit might be susceptible to this confusion. And there might even be some same different judgments that, that you could use the same argument about. But the, over the years, the, the way in which uh, categorical perception is tested has become more and more sophisticated. So it's been done now with speeded visual search, with he hemispheric asymmetric asymmetry for within versus cross category pairs, with and without verbal interference, uh, with visuospatial interference, was a, a, a technique called semantic satiation. And it's there whether you measure accuracy, reaction time, passive viewing with eye tracking, EEG, and now with fMRI. Um, so, uh, and most recently with uh, continuous flash interference uh, in visual search. So uh, a vis typical visual search task would be one like this, where what the participant sees is a fixation cross in the center of the screen, followed briefly by a, a circle of color patches or faces, um, of which one is slightly different from the others. And uh, hopefully it's fairly obvious that that's the odd one out in this circle, and that's the odd one out in this circle. And so the participant's task in this experiment is just to report whether the, the odd one out falls to the left or the right of fixation. Uh, and what you find is that uh, there are differences between the left and right visual fields um, 
depending on uh, uh, the, this is sort of depending on whether the uh, stimuli are within category or whether the odd one out is the same category as the distractors or from a different category. So again, it's testing this categorical perception effect, but with a, um, a, a different, more complex paradigm. And the differences that you find are dependent on reaction time and visual field. And I think it's very difficult to argue then that this is the sort of, this is judgment rather than perception. So I think we uh, can skip happily down the corridor saying we don't uh, fall foul of, of that floor either. That our results are contaminated by uh, bias or by the demand characteristics of the experiment itself. So the example that they use um, for this is the example of the uh, yellow and orange uh, light bulb experiment. And they suggest that uh, German subjects, rather than visually experiencing the colored discs as yellow, uh, that they were simply following convention and assigning the yellow orange discs the socially appropriate names for that context. Again, it's possible in that case that they might have a point. But we've also done it and found that priming effects, um, the priming effects um, categorical perception. So it's not just the, whether the current pair of stimuli that you're looking at is a within or between category. That the previous set of pair of stimuli that you saw before that one also affects the results. Um, it's also the case that using an identical set of stimuli, you get a very different pattern of results depending on whether you're looking at English speakers, uh, Barinmo uh, speakers, or Himba speakers. But this is for the same set of categories. So it's difficult to argue under those circumstances that... Um, that it, it's, it's anything to do with uh, bias. And the, the fifth claim, the claim that it's peripheral attentional effects, um, and this is made largely on the basis that when you ask people to look at, to look at this pair of stimuli, these two faces, there is a very robust effect that people report that this face is, appears darker than this face on the page. That, there is, that there's more contrast between this and the white background than there is. Well, in fact, they're equiluminant. As, as you can see, as soon as the faces are blurred, it becomes very apparent that they're equiluminant. So the idea is that here, the judgment is driven by the fact that this is a, a, a different race face. Um, that, that people's knowledge about the, the uh, dark-skinned races are darker in real life overrides the fact that these two images have been uh, balanced for perceptual difference. And no amount of attention can change your impression of the color of that dress. Um, so this was the, the great excitement of uh, a couple of years back of um, the, 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 the great internet controversy about whether the dress was in fact uh, white and gold or blue and black. And uh, it's very difficult once you've seen the original as one or other of those. There are some, some good explanations around of why that arises, but I'm not going to go into them here. It's also the case that uh, when you're looking at attention, um, that if you take away some information from a facial expression, you can actually, and if you take away the bits that children normally attend to, uh, you actually improve their discrimination of facial expressions. So um, the explanation that we've come up for this in particular is that children have a tendency to attend to the eyes on all faces. And if you're discriminating facial expressions, there are actually other bits of the face, the mouth area, that's more informative. 
So actually, if you put sunglasses on the faces so that they can't see the eyes, you're forcing their attention to something else. Um, and that actually improves their performance. But in standard um, the condition where they can see the whole face, we've argued that this can't be an attentional effect, the fact they show the categorical perception between categories, because if it was, performance wouldn't improve if uh, you directed their attention elsewhere. Uh, this is uh, from uh, Rachel Jack's lab in Glasgow. Um, this is just showing that it's also the case that attention varies um, between cultures. Um, so these are Westerners and these are East Asians looking at the same images of facial expressions of emotion. And this is a heat map showing the uh, pattern of gaze that they show when uh, deciding what um, expression the face is showing. And the idea is that although there are some similarities between the, the direction of gaze, they're all looking at the eyes, the nose, and the mouth, uh, that actually there are significant differences between the pattern with which those are, are looked at. This is just in a passive viewing, so they're not asked to do anything just look at this face um, and that the pattern of viewing is analyzed and that these differ significantly between cultures. Um, so our most recent set of experiments use continuous flash suppression paradigm. And you're about to tell me to stop. Yeah, okay, so I'm wrapping up very quickly. Despite a pile of evidence from a wide range of researchers, there's still a deep divide between the universalist and relative positions um, uh, for colors and facial expressions for, for perceptual categories. Even though we get away, um, I think, scot-free from those uh, six um, flaws that uh, we're accused of, it actually doesn't mean that we get away scot-free altogether, and it doesn't mean there's no work left to do, because there are strong context effects that uh, haven't really been properly investigated. Um, it makes a difference whether you test colors in uh, an ordered test array like that or randomized um, uh, Some categorical partitions might appear universal. Here's Europe. His, uh, I, I thought I ought to have a slide that brought Europe into the, uh, into the picture somewhere. So um, here's another reason why some categorical partitions might, uh, in language might appear to be universal. Um, this is the sort of uh, partition of Africa between 1885 and 1914. And as you can see, there's quite a lot of European influence in there. Um, there are some wider contextual issues uh, because the experiments that we've done looking at categorical perception are all done in controlled laboratory tasks and they tell us how people um, process uh, percepts of faces or colors. But what they don't tell us is the real world interactive processes that go on. So when we produce a facial expression of emotion, whether, whatever we identify it as, it has a social context. And if you smile at me, and then I don't smile back, what happens next? So I think we need to take these things out of the lab, and we need to look at the effects of uh, perceptual processing in a real world, in a social context. Uh, and just very briefly to say that we have done this with a small group, so we... Uh, discovered with our uh, young autistic male subjects that they were getting into trouble with the police quite a lot, um, the adolescent ones. And we talked to the police and we said, well, what happens typically when you interview um, one of these young men? And they said, they respond inappropriately. And I said, what do you mean? And they said, we're telling them off and they start laughing um, or, or they start not paying attention. Um, 
And uh, we said, well, have you tried asking them whether they have a diagnosis of autism? And they said no. And uh, so they, they ran a trial and they did ask every young man who was being interviewed, uh, do you have a diagnosis of autism? And they came back and said, it's wonderful, it works. They said it completely diffuses the situation. As soon as somebody says, yes, I have a diagnosis of autism, um, the, the, the person who's interviewing them relaxes and no longer expects the appropriate responses. They, they can deal with the inappropriate responses. They said, it also works with the ones who aren't. And I said, what do you mean? And they said, well, you say to somebody, have you got a diagnosis of autism? They say, no, I have not. And they said, well, stop behaving as if you have. So um, I think we need to take them out of the lab. Um, we have a proposed explanation of why we think uh, that HIMBA might have less abstract categories than we have, but I haven't got time to go into that. So thank you very much.